This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute, welcoming you to another in our series of Military History Nights for Spring 2014. On March the 5th, our speaker was Commander Fraser McKee of the Royal Canadian Naval Volunteer Reserve, who told the story of the raid on the Normandy Dock at St. Nazaire in May 1942, and the four Canadians who participated in it. Thank you, John. I'm delighted to see a lot of old friends and new friends here this evening, and, and in fact, uh, a new friend in uh, Christopher Rogers, who had a relative, a, a cousin, that was at St. Nazaire, and in fact, like uh, some of the Canadians, was killed there. So there's a direct connection in the room itself to the battle at St. Nazaire. <clears throat> this whole thing started, uh, oh, about 10, 12 years ago, <clears throat> with uh, when Brigadier Ted Brown called me and they were doing a refurbishing of the names in the uh, Hart House Soldiers Tower. He was, he was very much involved with another group with refurbishing the Soldiers Tower and the museum they have up in here. And he called me and he said, one of the names on there, we can't find out anything about him, a fellow by the name of Surgeon Lieutenant Winthrop. And his his name is uh, is on the uh, on the listing in the tower. Sir Lieutenant W. J. Winthrop, RCNVR. And he said we can't find out anything about him. In fact, on that listing and on the same listing in the tower, there are two names. Another one, Lieutenant G. M. Baker, RCNVR, and the same sort of thing. No record at all. That was because they were serving with the Royal Navy. They weren't on, uh, on, on service with the Canadian Navy. They'd been loaned to the Royal Navy. So why were these men on the list and without an easily found history? Well, it didn't take me long with, from my own books and dealing with various organizations to find out why. St. Nazaire is there on the coast of Brittany and France. There's England, and there's St. Nazaire. I was there a year and a half, two years and a half ago, and had a look. It's known more for submarine pens. It was a major base by 1942 of the U-boat arm at St. Nazaire and Brest and various places like that. But its, it's main claim to fame was because they were worried about these ships. That's the... Uh, Bismarck, and there were two of them, the Bismarck and the Tirpitz. The Tirpitz is the one that was up in uh, Norway, and the Air Force spent most of the war trying to bomb it into submission. And the thing was that the only place, if they were damaged, that they could be repaired outside Germany was at the Normandy dock in St. Nazaire, which was built to handle the liner Normandy in the 1930s, built specifically for the Normandy. It, technically, its name isn't the Normandy dock, but it was always called the Normandy dock because that's what it was built for. And, if there, and that's where Bismarck was headed for when she was sunk. Uh, in, in earlier, uh, later on. She was heading for the dry dock, or earlier on. She was sunk in, uh, on the way, because she'd been slightly damaged, but on her way to St. Nazaire. It would also handle the, that's the Scharnhorst, uh, the heavy battle cruisers. Outside Germany, there wasn't a dockyard. I mean, there were, the Italians had one in the Mediterranean, but that wasn't very practical. So it was very important to do something about that bloody dockyard in France. That's St. Nazaire Harbor in peacetime, and there's the Normandy dock facing the sea, and it's bigger than you think. This is a, uh, they can seal this off here, and here, and there, and there, and this is a, a, a dock where you're going to keep ships and so on. And there's a gate that goes across here. There isn't. A, there's a gate here, but it's more or less permanently closed. And this is the Gironde River up here. And that was what they were talking about. Well, it's not a lot of use calling the Air Force in to bomb it, because that's a bloody small target. It's not enough of use destroying all this. First of all, it's occupied by a lot of French who were reasonably uh, favorable to us. Uh, and to try and damage that gate there so that the dock was unusable was almost an impossible job. We're talking the days before the bouncing bomb used in the Eider and the Mone Dam and so on. 
there's a, a drawing of it, and this is the track that they were able to use, and there's the dock there coming in, and that's what they were trying to try and do. There's the dock itself. Uh, it's too bad there isn't a person, but you can see there, there's a there's a multi-story building, so you can see how big it is, and there's the gate they're talking about. Now, it isn't a gate like the Welland Canal that goes like this. It's a gate that slides back and forth, and it's driven by electric motors, which are buried down here, and this is the uh, main case on here. And once you drove a ship in, then you, you slid the gate closed from this side across to there, and then you pumped the water out, and your ship sat on these blocks and was repairable. There's a close-up of the side of it, and what the dock looked like, you can get some impression of the size of it. There it is from Seaward, taken a couple of years ago, and that's what the uh, destroyer faced when she came in because it's no good ramming it when the tide is out. You want it when the tide is in and you can hit the top part of the dock. But that's the that's the gate there which would slide that way out of the way to let a ship in and out and with the water. And that is how you get at it. This is from seaward up the Jura, up the Giron River and up into St. Nazaire which is about oh, 10, 15 kilometer, kilometers up inside. Uh, the idea was to destroy the gate, and the British uh, looked at it, and by January 1942, they realized this was going to be pretty serious, because if those battleships got out into, you have to make the Germans as nervous as possible about using them in the Atlantic convoys, as John said. If one of those ships got out, you end up with a thing like the Jarvis Bay example, where one ship sank five merchant ships, and it was only through the heroics of Fogarty Fagan and the New Zealand shipping company, Jarvis Bay, that prevented them sinking half a convoy, because there was absolutely no way you could do much damage. But if the ships were damaged at all, then it would, the Germans had a real problem. Because if you haven't got that dockyard, now you've got to get the ship back to Germany to repair it. And that was exposing it to more danger. So the dockyard was pretty important. And what they decided to do was to take a ship up to the dockyard and ram the gate and blow it up. The W.J. Winthrop was born in Saskatoon. He took an arts degree in Saskatoon, and then he came up to the University of Toronto and took a medical degree. And that's a picture of him, uh, his graduation photograph from the University of Toronto in 1937. He then taught here in 1937, and, and then decided in, in 1940 that he joined the Navy. Uh, in a short time, he was sent up to Thunder Bay, where he was a duty medical officer. He apparently had almost no training at all, and was sent to Thunder Bay to be the local medical officer. Then the Royal Navy wanted uh, medical people. They had lots of ships, unlike the Canadian Navy. The Canadian had thousands of sailors coming from the prairies of Nova Scotia and Ontario and so on, but not many ships. The Royal Navy, on the converse, had all sorts of ships with not enough sailors, and by sailors I mean medical people as well. So they asked if Canada could provide some, and they said sure, so they sent Dr. Winthrop over. Another man they sent is Graham Baker. He was uh, studying at Oxford College, and he joined the Navy in uh, 1941 from Oxford, and, uh, but he came home quite briefly, did a little bit of training, and then was sent back over to the Royal Navy. And they were both serving there. There were also two others that are involved in this story from St. Nazaire, Lloyd Davies, RCNVR from Montreal, who I knew after the war. Uh, he was made a prisoner of war. He was one of the ones that was wounded, quite badly wounded. I met him at New York, uh, and he was the staff at RCN. He, he converted over to the Royal the Canadian Navy after the war and stayed in the Navy. He was still picking up pieces of shrapnel. Every now and then he'd have a, a Band-Aid on his neck, and he'd say, well, wait a minute, I'll show you, and he'd do this. And he'd show him he had a little tiny piece of shrapnel because his, the fair mile he was escaping in was sunk when a shell hit her mast and sprayed everybody on the bridge with shrapnel and then knocked the engine out of it and she sank and he was captured. And John 
no, a bad spelling, sorry, the, the current one has a spelling mistake, John Edward O'Rourke, uh, who is a mystery figure, because I've been able to find out anything about him at all, except that he came from Montreal, and he went out west when he came back after the war, and he was the only one of the Canadians that got home that day. Uh, they're the people that read the St. Nazaire Raid. In January, they decided that the, the way to do it was going to be to ram something in the way of a ship or something into the lock gate and then blow it up. So the way to do that, and that really wasn't quite enough because you're going to have to, if you could, destroy the, the gate operating equipment and the flooding and pumping equipment. So this meant you blew up the gate and then you had to blow up the electrical equipment that I had said was down below in the all encased in concrete. So they sent off a commando under... Colonel Newman, Charlie Newman, and uh, Sam Beatty, that one, he commanded the destroyer that they used, and uh, Red Ryder, uh, he was Ro Richard Ryder, but he was always called Red Ryder because of his uh, initials, uh, he commanded the whole operation. There were 622 in, on the raid, 345 naval people manning various ships, which I'll go into, uh, 275 army commandos, and that includes some signals, some uh, first aid people, the whole thing. The army in total was 275, and two press, oddly enough. They didn't land, fortunately for them. Uh, those that were killed were 168, or 27.5%. Well, compared to a lot of battles, that's not too bad. That's pretty bad, but it's not, not as bad as some of them. Uh, there were 104 naval people killed, which is about 30 percent, and uh, 64 army, and uh, 215 became prisoners of war. So it really wasn't a big success from the point of view of casualties. That's what they decided to use. That's the Buchanan, and she was one of the 50 American destroyers that Churchill negotiated in 1940. We received six of them and later a seventh. Uh, they look like that in our hands. That's Columbia, one of the Canadian ones. You can see what they look like. They were lousy ships. I made one trip and one scared the daylights out of me in the wintertime in February 1944. Uh, but it was, they were uncomfortable, they rolled like the devil, because you can see how narrow they were, but they were very fast, which was an advantage. We took two of the masts out, the, uh, two of the funnels out, they had four funnels, four funnels, no, uh, and we took two of the funnels out because they didn't need all that speed as convoy escorts, but they were better than nothing, and so we used them for there. Uh, to rescue the people after they got rid of the destroyer by blowing her up in the lock gate, they used a bunch of Fairmile motor launches. They had 12 of them. They, were, they do about 22 knots altogether. They're made of wood entirely, double lap strake uh, 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 wood, mahogany and hardwood framing, two motors, uh, gasoline. Uh, this is one of the ones that went on the raid taken with a, a gun especially mounted. Normally they'd have an orlican forward. That's a pom-pom or a makeshift gun of some kind. Those are depth charges along the stern. They'd have a crew of about 22 or 23. They cut the crews down to about 16 to operate them and they carried, each of the ones carried a commando. That's a Canadian one. That's what they look like normally. That's one of the Canadian ones. The uh, the ones built in, in the Great, they're nearly all built in the Great Lakes, one yard in Nova Scotia and one yard on the West Coast. Built them. That's a Canadian one with the Orlikan forward instead of the heavier guns. They do about 20 knots. They're not a bad ship. Uh, they were, the raid was accompanied by two British Hunt class destroyers, which was fairly small, but very work a day. They built hundreds of them in, in four classes. As you see, they were they were destroyers, a single gun forward, another anti-aircraft gun aft. They do about 28, 30 knots, and so on. There is the 
ship, and that's Campbelltown. Uh, when the British got these ships, they, each ship was named after a town that was common in both England, or Scotland and Ireland, Northern Ireland, and in the States. And this one was named Campbelltown because there was a city in England and a town in the States called Campbelltown. Uh, they've stripped off a couple of masts. They've armored her bridge, put some plating around it. This is padding so that if you get splinters and so on flying around, it'll absorb a bit and give a bit of protection on the bridge. And they put a single gun forward, a 12-pounder gun forward, and, and then also aft, they, you can see just two masts, and they cut the masts down so they looked like a German uh, destroyer. The Elbing class destroyers had two masts and they had the sloping top. So they made her look, you know, at night, by searchlight with an uproar going on, it might look a bit like a German ship and they wouldn't fire at it or not keep firing at it, which in fact happened. They provided them with extra gun. Oops, sorry. Back again. Uh, they provided them with extra guns here and here, Orlikans, to firing, and they provided some protection, these flanges along the side behind which the commandos could lie. Well, that's pretty elementary. That's fine if the guy's firing at you with a, a German equivalent of a 303 or a 9 millimeter or something, more or less, but it's not much good if he happens to hit you with an Orlikan or something, and we had the Orlikans. The one thing about the Swiss, they're very, uh, very easy going. They'd sell their Orlikans to the Germans and to us. And so the Germans had all sorts of them as well. So there wasn't much protection, but there was a little bit of protection. And a lot of them were carried down below. Now the raid itself uh, left on March the 26th, 1942, from Falmouth down there. The commandos had been sent up to Scotland and done their training. Uh, they just grabbed uh, people from number two commando and they bored people from other commandos and they trained the 275 of them all together and finally ended up in the end of March 42 down in Falmouth to board the various ships and they, they fair miles, motor launches and there were two motor torpedo boats as well carrying in fact torpedoes. A, a Red Riders boat was a, a motor torpedo boat that had the speed he could maneuver and had good radio equipment. In fact, uh, Lieutenant O'Rourke was his radio officer. He was in charge of communications on, on Ryder's headquarters ship, and the other one carried two torpedoes with a job to do, which I'll tell you about. But that's where they left from, and that was the layout of the raid. The Campbelltown is there in the middle, and these are all fair miles down through here. And this was Winthrop's fair mile that he was to escape in, because once the, once the Campbelltown rammed the lock, the uh, fair miles were supposed to go alongside her and rescue those of the crew that had survived, and any of the commandos that had done their job in blowing up the pumping equipment down below in the dock, uh, and take them home. Uh, there were two MTBs. There's one there, and there was one MTB forward. Ryder in one, and the other one with the torpedo. The rest were all essentially carry command. Every every MTB, every fair mile, all these fair miles either side carried ten to thirty uh, commandos, as well as the um, as well as the ship's company. I'll go back to. There. The explosives were put uh, below that gun, down here, down in the lower deck. This was all open. This was the, what's called the four upper mess deck. It was open. The Germans, after she rammed the dock, the Germans could walk around. But they had put a bunch of depth charges. Now, depth charge weighs, well, 400 pounds in total. It has just under 300 pounds of, of uh, explosive. And they put 24 depth charges. It buried in metal down below here with a time fuse. Lieutenant Tibbets was the uh, anti-submarine officer who developed the thing, and he had safety things built in, and you couldn't tell they were there. And the Germans, in fact, after she rammed the deck, went on board and didn't find anything. And it was, but the but the whole bottom part of the ship back here was filled with explosive, which was the idea of the exercise. 
So off they set. That's the route they took down. The heavy line, straight line, is on the way down. Down at the bottom here, they ran into a U-boat, and there was a bit of a U-boat action, which they were worried might uh, give the game away, except the U-boat happened to see one of the escort destroyers, one of the hunt class destroyers, steaming in another direction. So he reported that, and that was picked up, and it was reported back to him, no, they think you're heading north or northwest, and it's all right, and so they went on. So they went on, and along here, and up here, by this time it's nighttime, coming into St. Nazaire. That's the way they're on. Now, this part here is all sandbags. So the ship had been stripped down as much as they could. They took as much, apart from the explosive, they took as much equipment off as they could to lighten her. They'd normally draw about, oh, maybe 20, 25 feet, a little less, and they wanted her to draw not more than 15 feet. And, and, and because the channel goes up this way, and look, these are guns up here all the way, and then all sorts of guns here, and some guns here. And But bear in mind that you're coming up at night, about uh, 11 o'clock at night, and 10 o'clock, and he arrived here, in fact, at the gate at three minutes late at about 1.30 in the morning, 1.35 in the morning. Uh, but this is the way, and, that, and you're talking that diagram I showed you of the fair miles falling, and, and then at the last minute, the boats in front cleared out of the way. The, these are the guns you can see, the protection along the side here. They were challenged part way down. Come on. Sorry. There. There. They were charged, challenged part way down when they were about there, there was a ship there, a German ship that challenged them, and they had a, a German-speaking uh, seaman on the bridge. He was able to reply. They had somehow learned, and I think I knew, but I forget, the, what the signal of the day was, which would be two letters or two letters and a number, and they were able to reply, and there had been a couple of shots fired at them, and then the searchlights were turned off, and they went on, and then they realized this there was something fishy going on. They sent a message back in plain language saying they had been damaged, they didn't have all their code books, and they were coming in for repairs. So the Germans eased off, and by that time, they were further up. They were up to about here by that time, and by that time, they began to fire steadily at them. That's the kind of defenses, in other words, what firepower Campbelltown and the warships had, the Fairmiles had, wasn't an awful lot of use. That was taken two and a half years ago. There's so much concrete and it's all reinforced steel that in most cases they haven't even bothered to take it down. It's just too much and too costly and too bloody difficult to take it all down. There's a fair amount of them. That's a submarine pen, and the submarine pens are still there. That's one. Most of them are being used as storage or for yacht repair. You can, if you haven't got a sailboat or you take the mast down, you can run in, and several yacht repair yards are using the old submarine pen. This one doesn't happen to be at St. Nazaire, but they're all the same. There's another one. But you can see the massive stuff, so there wasn't much they could do about knocking it down. The Air Force had been asked to lay on a raid to smash up things a bit before the boats arrived. The Air Force arrived over St. Nazaire earlier in the evening of the 29th, the 28th technically, and, uh, but it was cloudy and they dropped four or five bombs, which unfortunately, and uh, this, is, this is one of the reasons the Navy has a great deal of trouble with the RAF, is that all they did was stir things up. So instead of the guys being at home in bed and nothing going on in the harbor, they were all up either around or actually manning their anti-aircraft defenses when the ships arrived, which was rather unfortunate for the way things were to go. But they were there, and uh, that's the best they could do uh, for the Air Force. Then the Air Force went home, which seemed to be rather sad. There's the cover of the book, and that gives you sort of, uh, it's a drawing, and, and in fact, it's the, uh, the, the copy of the book is there, and there's dozens of books I've put out, most of them on the table there, but that's what she would have looked like at the last minute with shell fire going on and doing her best to 
fire at anything that was going on, and she'd be firing her orlicans here and here on both sides. But she was doing about 30 knots by this time, as fast as she could go. And the, the uh, Lieutenant Baker, who was in one of the fair miles, was supposed to, oops, sorry, come on, uh, was supposed to land there, at the, what was called the Old Mole, because they were to land troops there and attack up in through the town here, the commandos, and trying to get a, a line ashore, the, there were uh, armed sentries on the jetty, and they were spraying the fair mile with machine gun fire, and he was killed without even getting ashore. Uh, the uh, three Canadians that were either captured or killed, uh, Baker there, uh, after the destroyer rammed the lock gate here, the fair mile came alongside number 411 and picked up uh, uh, Lieutenant Winthrop and quite a few, quite a few who were already pretty badly injured with the gunfire that they'd opened on just before she rammed the lock gate. And, but he got into the fair mile and was heading back down the river and he was killed when his fair mile was hit. Uh, in the engine room, knocked an engine right out the side of the ship. I spoke to the sub-lieutenant who was in command of the Fair Mile uh, oh, six or eight years ago, and uh, he said, as far as they know, he didn't get off the ship. They got a few off in wooden planks, and they had a, a life raft on board, and it was in the water, but he wasn't in it. So what happened to him, I don't know. His body was later recovered, uh, washed up on the shore outside St. Is there. <coughs> the one that was made a prisoner, Lloyd Davies, was in a fair mile here. He was hit in the, in the mast right behind the bridge. He was sprayed with shrapnel, so there was quite a bit of wounding going on. And then it was also hit in the hull, and the engine stopped, and the Germans came alongside and captured them. But that's what happened to the poor Canadians. But the su fairly successful, that's the next morning, about 9 o'clock in the morning. You can see there's a fair amount of damage, shell holes and so on, but the gun is still serviceable. And she's well up. By this time, the stern is down here. She's rammed up over the gate. This is the lock gate here. She's rammed up, and the, the munitions are right below that gun, right up against the bottom of the lock gate. And there's all these people milling around, having a nice look at what the weather has to offer. And in fact, Sam Beatty, in the fighting in the village, uh, or the town of St. Nazaire, that, that morning between midnight or 1 o'clock when she rammed, and, and by middle of the morning, they'd captured most of the people that were still alive and hadn't got away in the motor launches. Sam Beatty was one of the ones. And the officer inter interrogating him was the naval officer in charge in the harbor. And he said, you don't really think that running a, an elderly, old, lightweight destroyer into the lock gate is going to be a real problem to us, do you? Because it was pretty obvious what had happened. Look, you can see the damage here. Shell fire, things blown up. Germans having a look around, see what, see what was going on. And there's this is the other side. More shell fire, large holes, hole here, uh, damage there. Uh, Gunfire, shell holes here, orlicans in this funnel, and so on. So you can see why the Germans didn't think this was a big deal. They they pull her off, and the lock gate would have to get repaired. Well, that's taken from inside the lock. This freighter was sitting in the dried out lock. There's Campbelltown, well up over the lock gate, and people around taking dice photographs. While Sam was being interviewed, there's suddenly this colossal crash. The windows of the office he was being interviewed is blown in, and Sam uh, says to the officer, well, I think that makes it fairly successful, and it certainly did. <laughs> That's the lock the next day. They had to seal it off with earth. Uh, and, and planks across the gate. That's, that's the remains of Campbelltown. Oops, sorry. Uh, come on. 
that's the remains of Campbelltown there. Uh, that I think is probably the interlock gate because th this is her uh, this is her bow here, and that's Campbelltown. That's all that's left while they're trying to dismantle it a few days later. Uh, this is the lock taken uh, photograph taken by the Air Force. There's the outer gate sealed with sandbags and sand and woods and planks. There's the remains of Campbelltown. That's the inner gate. No, I'm sorry, that's the outer gate there. That's the outer gate there, sealed with sand on. This leads to the inner harbor. You're looking north out of here. There's, a week later, Campbelltown's been taken to pieces, and that's looking out toward the, the earth part of the dam. St. Nazaire today. That's Campbelltown's gun from the folks of which the German historians are fortunately uh, were uh, satisfied to rescue, mounted on the seafront at St. Nazaire with a plaque on it saying what it was. That's the monument to the people that lost their lives and another one listing everybody uh, spelling, putting the wrong initials on Winthrop. He was WJ, not WS, uh, but uh, taken at Saint Nazaire, on the key front at St. Nazaire. The French are very proud. Quite a few Frenchmen were killed because after the explosions, the Germans were pretty gun happy and they were inclined to shoot anybody that didn't identify themselves at once, so they shot some of their own people. Uh, some of them were taught people, like the workmen that had been working around town and building the concrete emplacements and that kind of thing. And uh, so they weren't recognized as German soldiers, so some of them were shot. Quite a few French people were shot. And only three of the soldiers that were uh, not taken away in the fair miles were able to escape down to France. They escaped to the south and eventually got home through through Spain and uh, Gibraltar. That's a model, and they, there's a, a, quite a nice museum in the dockyard at Saint Nazaire. There's a, a model of the Campbelltown as she would have looked as she was going toward the lock. That's the cemetery at uh, uh, Bilax, old uh, Sir, Sir Ball, get the name, uh, and where the only body that was found of the two that were killed was uh, Escublac, Escublac La Ball, which is about 20 kilometers north of St. Nazaire, just in a little village. We had a hard time finding it. It's my son walking around. Uh, it's in the middle of a residential area, inland, not right on the water. His body was found on the beach, and they said it was buried secretly by local French women that found it. Uh, there's no particular reason. They had, a, they had a funeral for those that had been killed, and the Germans turned out a guard, and the British were allowed to have a flag draped over the coffins and so on. They, they thought it was a very bold enterprise, especially by that time, the lock gate being made unusable. But, uh, they, uh, but anyway, uh, Winthrop is buried there. Uh, Baker's body was never found. That's Surgeon Lieutenant W.J. Winthrop, RCNVR, HMCS Campbelltown. 28th of March, 1942. That's Baker. And a few of the statistics, figures vary slightly, it depends on what you count and so on. 622, Army and Navy, 68 were killed in those percentages. Thus, 383 didn't get home, about 60% didn't get home. They were either killed or captured. There were five VCs awarded, uh, uh, Sam Beatty and the two Army and the uh, Red Rider got VCs, and one seaman and one sergeant got VCs, and uh, as allowed by the uh, Victoria Cross order, you are allowed to award a VC to one person selected to represent all those that no doubt deserved it. Uh, but, and that was what the two VCs, the Army Sergeant and the, Na and the Naval Able Seaman, were for, they themselves did some pretty heroic things, and their VCs represented the others that deserved them, no doubt. Uh, 21 Distinguished Service Orders and DSCs, 59 Consecutive Gallantry Medals, and so on and so on. 
uh, one seaman and one army VC to stand for the dessert. One, air, one Fairmont was sent home on the way down with engine trouble, and the two, uh, two others were of all that group that went, two others got home. Uh, one MTV was scuttled on the way, two damaged to make it, and three got home. Uh, one of the MTBs, one of them, was its job was to fire, and if I go back, I can show you, there was a side entrance into that upper lock, and his, his job was to fire a torpedo into that lock gate as well. It was a normal uh, hinged gate, open the normal lock way that we're used to, and as they were leaving at about three in the morning, he fired two torpedoes into the lock gate, but they were set with delayed timing devices. So they all, the MTBs left home. The advantage of the MTB was he could jink around, they could do about 35 knots, and so they could get home without too much trouble. Uh, the torpedo sat in the lock gate until late that next afternoon when suddenly they exploded. And of course, by this time, there are no commandos left, and the Germans figuring there's another raid going on, and again, they shot what they estimate to be 20 more local either German or Tot or French, or French troops, which uh, sort of pleased our people, but it seemed a bit, a bit unfair on those that had nothing to do with it. But the Germans were very, very uh, nervous about the whole thing. Uh, so that's where it all started. That's the soldier's tower with the names uh, on the, the carving. And you can, next time you walk through there, <coughs> you can have a look and see the two Canadians that were at St. Nazaire. And all that's left, this was in one of the submarine pans in St. Nazaire, Dershine verboten, passage on to the no passing. So there's still the odd signs around the lock. Wasn't repaired until 1967, and in 1967 uh, they they reestablished it as a as a dry dock for the French to use. And I always end my talks with this slide because it's my favorite slide. It has nothing to do with Saint Nazaire at all. It's just a lovely working ship photograph. That's the Canadian frigate La Haloise in lousy weather as usual in the harbor at Liverpool coming in from convoy escort, looking scruffy, careworn, but I think it's just a lovely picture of what life was really like. But that's the way it was, and that's the way it was at St. Nazaire, too. That was the way life was, and maybe it wasn't a good idea, but it accomplished the aim, and whether it was worth it or not, anybody who had somebody killed there, like Robert's cousin who was killed, he was an officer on the bridge, a lieutenant in Campbelltown, <coughs> and he was killed before he had a chance to get away in the fair mile, they probably think it wasn't worth it, but from the overall point of view, the aim was achieved and that the lock was destroyed and the Germans never had a chance to use it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's St. Nazaire. Now, if there are any questions, I'll be doing it from memory to some extent, but uh, I'll be glad to take any questions if anybody has any. How soon after it ran the gate did it explode? Oh, it exploded about, uh, well, there's a bit, of, a bit of controversy within sort of 10 minutes. About, about 25 past 11 in the morning, it was supposed to go up about 8 o'clock in the morning, and Sam Beatty, who was the one that was captured, the captain of Campbelltown, was really worried. He was afraid something had gone wrong, the, the fusing had been destroyed or something. And uh, he was greatly relieved when it blew up and the window of the interview office blew in. But it went up about 11.30 the next morning, and nobody knows why it was delayed. It wasn't supposed to be delayed that much. But, and Tibbets was killed during the raid. He did get away, which is too bad, because the explosive arrangement was all set up by him. How wide was the Hagen house? Of the lock itself? No, they come into the harbor. You show us pictures of how the ships. Or to be about, uh, oh, maybe 100 feet across. Uh, you and I are old enough to work in feet still instead of uh, beaters or whatever the kids work in nowadays. It'd be about 100 feet across, I would think. No, the yeah. river was wider than that. 
Oh, oh, the river was good. Yeah, the river there is quite wide, but it's quite shallow. It's not all, you, you know, I showed you where the channel went up the St. Nazaire side, but it was, oh, probably three quarters of a mile, maybe a mile wide, because they were, they were firing from the far side, uh, like the, the uh, let me see, what would it be, the south, southwest side at the, at the ships coming up, but from, they were firing from both sides. Oh, sorry. If they planned that raid to go after just the dock, why didn't they go after the submarine tanks at the same time? They were inside the next lock. And to do that, you would have had to take the commandos in there. And by that time, they, they had done their job, which was to uh, blow up the lock. They went down the stairways, which I'm talking twice the height of this down like as though you went from here down into the basement to blow up the pumping equipment and by that time they were fighting for their lives to get away but that wasn't one of the targets uh, it would have been pretty hard to do much damage you saw, you saw the photograph of them they were steel reinforced they were designed to withstand bombing which they did until late in the war when they began to use the tall boy bombs which would penetrate uh, 15 feet of reinforced concrete but it wasn't until 1944 45 you were getting uh, bombs that would do that and the submarine pens were on the inner you came up through the that long entrance up in through the second lock not through the dry dock it was the dry dock they were after not the submarine bed they couldn't do anything you'd have to bombing or a, a major raid like the Dieppe raid with 3,000 people would have been the only way to get at the submarine pens the source of the, your final quotation, please. Henry the, uh, Henry the, Henry the fifth, yes. Well, Henry the fifth, they are, it, it was his answer to the, to the Dauphin, who, uh, when they said, do you want to give up now? And he said, no, no, we're just the warriors for the working day, but on the Saint main, Christmas our hearts day. are in the main. On St. Christmas Day. Uh, yeah. Chris, was this a uh, combined operations operation? Yes. That's the one and only really successful one. Oh no, because they, they uh, there were there were other successes. They after the Saint Nazaire, for instance, the commandos uh, went in on the side of the Saint Nazaire, grabbed some German radio uh, radar equipment, and left again, which helped them solve the radar problem, how the Germans were tracking and bombing England, and also taught them how to how to confuse the German radar. And that was a big, it was the only real success on the Dieppe raid, but it was very successful. And there were a couple of others like that, but it was one of the big success. But the raid on Lofoten uh, up on the, uh, up the Norwegian coast by, um, by Lord, uh, Lo uh, Simon Fraser, Lord Lovett's uh, three army commando was very successful. They lost, I think they lost two people at that. They now blew up the fish oil and the, um, the supply system on the Foten Islands off Norway. They ran, so there were, there were successful ones, but this was, you know, it depends on what, it was successful in that the aim was achieved, but it was pretty costly. Uh, Let's take. In the, was the Camel Town like, uh, made light because the draft was 10 foot, I believe, below, and it had to go over a sandbar and over a torpedo net? No, there were no torpedo nets. Uh, we learned slowly, and, and I guess the Germans did too, but they didn't have torpedo nets across the way Halifax Harbor and Sydney Harbor did. Uh, there were no nets to cross. There was a sandbank, and in fact, she touched bottom at one stage of the game, which rather worried Sam Beatty, uh, but it was just a scraping. They felt she rubbed across, and, and they were pretty powerful. They had two large propellers, and... Uh, but she was made light because of the sandbanks. They took everything off they could, uh, you know, balancing what they had for defense uh, guns and, and the explosives right forward. But it was done to get across the sandbank because they didn't want to go up the channel, which was in within a couple of hundred yards of the German guns, which might have been fatal. How long was the dock out of action as a result? They, the French didn't get it back into action again until late 1947. As far as I know, well, I know it's still there because I had a picture of it and it's still operating to this day. 
but it took them a long time to get it back. And I gather it still operates the same way with a sliding gate, not a hinged gate. So it was done for the duration of the war? Oh yeah, it wasn't usable at all because it, they did they they hadn't didn't have a way to get ships in the other way and anyway the battleships that they were the British were worried about couldn't have got up and around and come in at, from the uh, north end anyway they the only way into it was from the seaward end and that was the one they destroyed. It was interesting because there were some locks in I think Southampton. Uh, there's a, somebody from England may know there's a shipyard there and a lock system and they took the commandos through the lock system and showed them what the operating equipment looked like uh, that they were going to have to blow up so that when they arrived down with just flashlights so the power was off they'd recognize the driving equipment to pump and, and operate the lock gate to see it so they took them down through a, 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 a dry dock in Southampton to have a look at it so they know what they were after. How, how big a part did the weather play? Did, did they plan this attack to, uh, based on the, uh, a full moon or, uh, or uh, tides? Or? I think they must, I, I don't think it played any part at all. Well, it, it played a part, but I don't think it was a planned part in that they asked the, uh, the RAF to bomb those gun emplacements up the bank, and it turned out to be cloudy, so they couldn't see them. So they didn't. They dro a few of them sort of dropped bombs relatively indiscriminately, which certainly stirred the hornet's nest up a bit, which rather annoyed people, to say the least. And uh, it had to be high tide, and they planned to arrive at dark from the time they entered the Gironde River. So they were arriving at you know nine o'clock at night. It's in March. It's half light, and uh, so. Tide, I think, played more than a factor than the uh, than the. And this was I. I didn't look. I whether uh, she was fitted with radar, whether they could have done it in fog or not. I don't know. Interesting. Where where was uh, your cousin? He was on Campbelltown. He was a watchkeeper on the destroyer, right? He was he was on Campbelltown. And yeah. He was on the foredeck. Yeah, but he was one of the ship's company of Campbelltown. Yes. Yeah. He was on the uh, with Tibbets. He was he worked with Tibbets. Oh, I see. Laying the, putting the depth charges in and yeah. setting the fuse and so on. Yeah, and they were putting the, the uh, net overboard to get the commandos on the yeah. dock, and they were all hit by machine guns. Yeah. By this time, of course, you've got, uh, you know, so well, the ordinary dockyard protective force, all armed with everything from grenades to machine guns to rifles to pistols, firing away, obviously, all these people are enemy, and but, but they're also shooting each other occasionally. There were, I gather there was a complete confusion for quite a while until everything began to settle down. And by this time, of course, the commandos are down in the Drake setting time fuses, climbing up the ladder, running through and amongst the houses. Then they'll be allowed bang from the dockyard as the uh, this, uh, the uh, pumping equipment and the gate operating equipment was blown up and so on. So this was sort of going on until sort of three o'clock in the morning. And meanwhile, there's commandos running around with machine guns and everybody's shooting everybody else. And you can imagine nobody expecting it at all. And the commandos never having practice on that ground. They practice being commandos and the, the engineers with the explosive devices practice setting their fuses and so on. That was all very fine, but everybody was operating in the dark. Interesting. Well, thank you very much. This concludes today's webcast. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying thank you for listening. You can keep up with coming events at the RCMI by visiting our website at www.rcmi.org. We hope you'll tune in again, and we hope to see you in person at coming events. Thank you and goodbye.